What's good? This is for my boxing heads. I'm going to be talking about Panama Al Brown, who it says on the title, it says he's the first Latin American world champion. Also referred to as the first Hispanic or Latino world champion. I prefer the term Latin American, but you also hear it heard as Hispanic. In fact, there is a great article by ESPN in which I learned a lot about Al Brown. It's called The First Hispanic World Boxing Champion. And I will put that in the description. And I hope I could do his great career justice. Panama, Al Brown was obviously born in Panama, but he, he had... Most of his career outside of Panama. And he also had quite a personal life. Which I will go through after I discuss his career. But his personal life is very important. When discussing Panama Al Brown. Al Brown's physique. Was one like no other. You want to talk about. A guy like Ar Alexis Arguello. Who was a featherweight and six foot. Panama Al Brown. Was six feet. And he fought as a flyweight. And as a bantamweight. He also had an in, uh, reach of 60, 76 inches. Compared to Rocky Marciano. Who, who was 67 inches. So he was freakishly tall for his weight. And... He was he his final record stood at 123 and 18 losses and 10 draws with 55 knockouts. Boxrec has it. This is from other sources. Boxrec has it as 129 wins, 19 losses, and 14 draws with 59 knockouts. I usually go by Boxrec, but a few other sources have said he's 123, 18, and 10. So. I don't know which one to believe. They're they're a bit similar, but of course they vary. But okay, let's go. Let's go by his his career. Um, I I went through his career. I, of course, he had a lot of fights, but I'm gonna go through a few fights that I think are significant. He fought Willie Laport La Morte in his. Just doing a quick checkup. Yeah, he fought Willie Lamorte in his 14th fight and he lost a decision. And then he came back a few years later. Oh, well, yeah, next year, actually. The year later, he came back to knock him out in the second round. Lamorte, he was a good, I believe he was a good fight because he would later challenge. For the flyweight championship of the world. And that, that was no easy feat at that time. I will mention a, a few fighters like this. That fought for a world title. Or challenged for one. Or fought for let's say a European championship. Because the times were different. And there weren't as many belts. And the shots that you give were few and far between. So it was much more significant to get a world champion. A shot at the world title back then. Or to get. A shot at the European title or the British Commonwealth title. He fought Frankie Ash in his 24th fight. Frankie Ash was 63, 16 losses and 9 draws. He fought him in his 24th fight. Uh, he knocked him out the first round. Frankie Ash, he fought, he had a challenge um, the great Filipino fighter, flyweight Pancho Villa for his for his um for the flyweight title so he was a world class fighter he fought he fought Abe Goldstein who he lost to get oh, Goldstein was 65 wins 14 losses and 7 w with 7 draws he, Goldstein was a former flyweight champion he had five defenses of the flyweight championship before losing Henry S silly he was when he fought Panama Al Brown he was 56 5 and 4 and he he 
he lost, and then he had two draws. So he fought him three times. He could never beat him. But S Silly was he's that's S Silly is like a Italian name. So S C I L I E. He was a he was he was a former European bantamweight champion, and he made three defenses of that of that bantamweight title, and his. Final his final career stats are seventy five wins, seventeen losses, and twelve draws. So these are no chump chump these are no chumps. And this is way before he got his first shot at the Bantamweight Championship of the World. Because he was ranked years. He was ranked by the ring in nineteen twenty four as the third best flyweight and in nineteen 26 as the sixth best bantamweight, but he did not get a shot at the bantamweight championship until night until 1929 when he had over a hundred fights already. He fought U Eugene Creaky, who was 100 wins, 14 losses, and 15 draws. Creaky was a former featherweight champion, champion, and a European champion and a French champion. Then he fought Andre Rutis, who was 46 wins, 17 losses, and 6 draws. He lost to him. But Rutis would later beat Tony Canzaneri for the featherweight champion. So he was a future world champion at featherweight, a higher weight than in bantamweight. He fought Benny Schwartz, who was 67, 20, and 6. Schwartz was a two-time world, world, world title challenger, and he finished his career 80, 37, and 7. A lot of these guys, they have very good careers and very good records. I didn't even mention most of them, and a lot of these guys fought each other as well. Many people I, didn't, I won't even mention have great careers and great records. So... This is my version of highlighting his long, illustrious career. 20-year career. He started in 1922, and he ended in 1942. So, he fought Kid Francis, who was 66, three losses and two draws. He was he was a later a future world title challenger as well, and he finished his career at 102, 16 losses and 14 draws. He fought jo Johnny Cutbert. Who was 87, 87 wins, 22 losses, and 12, diff, 12 draws. He had a draw with with Panama Al Brown. He's he would become a three-time British featherweight champion, and uh, he was a future British lightweight champion. And he finished his career 124 wins, 34 losses, and and 17 draws. He fought Henry Corbett. Who was 106 wins, 26 losses, and 17 draws when Al Brown fought him. Corbett had beaten Johnny Cutbert, who we who we discussed just right now, for the British featherweight t championship, and then he lost to him. He fought Gustav Al Brown. Panama Al Brown fought Gustav Hummery, who was 33. Wins six losses and one draw. He knocked him out the first round. This is very significant because he knocked him out in 15 seconds. Before this fight started, both fighters um, both fighters collaborated with each other. And they said that they weren't going to touch gloves. So Panama Al Brown just knocked his ass out in 15 seconds. That, that was the fastest recorded knockout outside of the United States at that time. Humery finished his career 79 wins, 28 losses, and one draw. And he would he would later be a European lightweight champion. Okay, so this was all before he had the chance to to challenge anyone for any world titles. And he had already been a pro for seven years and he had already been ranked 
since 1926, as I mentioned before. And he was 54, 6, with 6 losses and 8 draws at that time. Then he fought he fought Vid, Vidal Gregorio for the Bantamweight New York State Athletic Commission world title. It would later it, he would then later get the NBA, the National Boxing Association world world title and the IBU world title. Some of his defenses, he made 11 defenses of this title, and he had the title for six years. A few of his defenses I'm going to go over. He beat Pete Sandstall. He also beat him in a non-title fight. That was his second defense. Sandstall was 77 wins, two losses, and five draws, and he was a former Bantamweight champion himself. His final record was 96, six losses, and and eight draws. Then he fought Eugene Huat, who was his third defense. Huat was 40 wins, 14 losses, and four draws. And he's a former flyweight champion from the IBU. His final record was 82 wins, 45 losses, and nine draws. He fought Kid Francis again. And we all know him. He was the first time he fought him, he was 66 wins, 3 losses, and 2 draws. Now he f- he fights him again. He was 87 wins, 9 losses, 9 losses, and 5 draws. So he has about, he has a lot more fights since, since he lost. The fighters back then, they kept, they kept busy. Even if they weren't fighting for a world title and they were champion, they kept busy. So this fight was in was in Canada and then Panama Al Brown came, became the victor by decision. Am I saying the right oh no 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 talking about the sandstone. Okay. So yeah, this fight was in France. Kid Francis being French. But they, they scored the fight for Panama Al Brown. A riot ensued after the after the the judges declared Brown the winner. And one of the judges got beaten up badly. That's why that's significant. So big riot after that fight. It wasn't a popular decision. Balmentio Balmenico. Bernasconi, who was 42 wins, 17 losses, and 5 draws. He was a former European bantamweight champion, and his final record was 44, 22, and 5. So he caught him at the end of his career. And he fought Johnny King. These are all his defenses, by the way. He fought Johnny King, who was 100 wins, 16 losses, and 8 draws. He was he was the Commonwealth. British champion at that weight. His final record was 162 wins, 50 losses, and 15 draws. He fought, Tony Mom Brown fought Young Perez, who he fought twice and beat twice. Won for the the championship. He was 70 wins, 10 losses, and 13 draws. And Young Perez had beaten Kid Francis and Eugene Hua, who we have heard, who we heard about earlier. And he was a former world title challenger himself. His last, his last defense. I'm checking if this is accurate. Nope. His second to last before he defended it again against Young Perez was against Baltasar. Oh no 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 no! My bad. My bad. My bad. He lost his title against Baltasar San San Chile in Spain. He lost the decision. Panama Brown was never stopped. San San Chile was fifty six wins, ten losses, and ten draws. And he beat Panama Brown twice. And San Chile's final record was seventy seven 
wins, 20 losses, and 12 draws. I'm sorry if I'm butchering any of these names. So after this after this loss, he fought Pete Sandstall, who he already beat, who he had already beaten in a title defense. He fought him again, he lost, and he decided that he should retire. But like most fighters, they don't like to retire right on top. Well, sort of on top. He was already he was already 13 years into the game, but he retired. He came back two years later. Another year, he beat in 1937. He retired in 1935. He came back in 1937, had a few fights, challenged Young Perez, knocked him out in the fifth round, and then he got that rematch with San Chile, and he beat him on points to once again become the IBU World Bantamweight Champion. And he never defended that title, and that was his last great victory. As I said before, his his final record stands at, according to Boxer, 129 wins with 59 knockouts, 19 losses, and 14 draws. Or, other sources say, 123 wins, 55 knockouts, with 10 draws. Whatever you want. And he was a huge figure in the Latin American boxing scene and in Panama, a huge hero. He was a slick boxer. He pretty much started the Panamanian, how can I say, the the Panamanian style. The Panama is known for their slick fighters, and that's what Panama Al Brown was. He was a slick fighter, liked to move around, liked to jab a lot, but he also had punch. Couldn't knock out everybody because he was fighting steep competition, but he was a very slick fighter, a very smart fighter. And he knocked out a few good opponents too. A bit on his personal life. So he's from Panama. Obviously Panama Al Brown. But he spent most of his time. He was he was a road warrior. He spent a lot of time in the United States and France. He fought in Spain. He fought in Sweden. He fought in Denmark. He fought in Tunisia and Africa. He fought in he fought in the United Kingdom. He fought in Canada, in Italy, in Germany, in Belgium. He he fought all over the world. And the people in Europe loved. They loved Panama Brown. In fact, Panama Brown was a showman. He was a, he went in France, he was a tap dancer. And the people loved him. He would go all over the place and, and they loved him. They didn't they didn't have the fixation on heavyweights like they do in the United States over there in Europe. They didn't care. As long as you they wanted to see skill being displayed. And that's what they got with Panama Al Brown. That's what they got. Another interesting fact about Al Brown is that they say he would smoke ten cigarettes a day and sip a like a full glass of champagne every day. So he was definitely a showman. I would compare that to like right now maybe a more vulgar uh, a Ricardo Mayorga who would do that and he, he would entertain fans by doing that. <laughs> How could you not like a guy like that, man? <laughs> you know he takes his craft seriously because... Because he's six foot and he's a bantamweight, but he also did that to entertain people, or he at least spread that rumor around. One big thing. This is a big one of his personal life that I referred to in the beginning of the video. He was openly gay. In a time right now that we love to praise people for their courage and everything, Panama would. Al Brown did that in the 1920s where it was extremely dangerous to do that. He was and and not just openly gay. I've I've heard that he, if you want to know where it's in the Hands of Stone the Roberto Duran autobiography, by biography, it said that he was flamboyantly gay. So he let it be known he had a lover. In fact his lover was was a coach. 
and he managed his career for a while. So, not only was Panama, so not only was he the first Latin American world champion, he was the first world champion to be openly and flamboyantly gay. But in the time that we want to praise people for first and for paving the way for other fighters, let's remember Panama Al Brown, who paved the way for these fighters that could be existing today. And that came after him, just um, Alexis Arguello for Roberto Duran, of course, Ismael Laguna, who were Panamanians, Chavez, De La Hoya, Nando Ramos, all the great Latin American champions. Panama Brown was the first, the trailblazer for that. And for as openly gay fighters, I think the only one right now would be... What was his name? Orlando Cruz, who got his butt beat by by Orlando Salido. But in a sport that's just so manly, can an openly gay fighter exist? I think Al Brown is the proof that they can. That you could be yourself and be a great fighter. You see his record. I named you a few of the fighters that he beat. He was champion for six years. That doesn't happen if you're not a great fighter. So you could be a great fighter, any race, any sexual orientation, and still be a great fighter. Because it doesn't matter what you are outside of the ring. It just matters what you bring into it. And I think that's what um, Panama Al Brown proves to the world. That it doesn't matter. That none of that matters. All that matters is skill. Unfortunately, like many great fighters... His life after the ring wasn't so great. Panama Al Brown's last fight was in 1942, 20 years into his career. He was 40 years old. He beat Kid Fortune in his home country of Panama by points. And soon after that, he he got caught using cocaine and then he got deported back to Panama. He came back to New York in his late 40s. And this is right off, right off the article I will put in the description, guys. So after that, he was broke. He needed money. So he became a sparring partner for up-and-comers. And he was getting beat up by these youngsters already in his late 40s, you know. He was getting $1 per round in the gyms of Harlem. Al Brown died the age of 40, 48 of tuberculosis. He collapsed. He fainted in the streets of New York. And the cops found him when he fainted, but they thought that but they, they thought he was drunk, so they took him into the station. Hmm, I assume why? Because of his color? Maybe, maybe. But this man had collapsed from tuberculosis. And you're gonna take him into the station? Just shows you the racism at that time. But they eventually sent him to the hospital in which he died in April eleventh. Of 1951, he was 48, broke, in a foreign country. So it's sad, really. Um, his end, he, his life came to a tragic end. Like many fighters back in the day, he he died broke. Even though he had a wonderful career, he died broke, penniless. You know, fighting for a dollar per round against young up and comers when he probably could have beaten their butts. In his prime. But yeah. It's kind of a cautionary tale. For fighters in the future. As well as from the lessons that he should have learned. From fighters in the past. Like Sam Langford. That well, most fighters back then. They died broke. Such a great career. But you could still end up broke. And dying in the streets of New York. From a disease that you caught. 
So yeah. So this was my tribute video to Panama Al Brown, who I had never heard of before like a week ago when I read about him in Duran's biography. And maybe many of you haven't heard of him. And if you have, and you could add something to this video, let me know in the comments, what did I miss? What maybe great fighters did Al Brown fight that I didn't mention? Or maybe something else that I didn't mention about Panama Al Brown's great career that you would like to add on. Because being the first Latin American world champion and openly gay world champion is nothing really to scoff at, in my opinion. Anyway, let's share our boxing knowledge to the YTBC, man. We're, we're all on some bullshit about business and all this. Let's get back to the history of boxing, the actual fighting. Let's get back to it. That's why I love some of you historical channels, man. I love it. Anyway, shout outs to the whole YTBC. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And if you watch this, please... Please share this because honestly, it <laughs> it took me a lot of work, but I think work that I enjoy doing, but I would like the career of the great Panama Al Brown to, to spread. So once again, thanks for watching and you guys have a great day. Peace.